You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast. Don't keep your day job. How to turn your passion into your career with Kathy Heller. T minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. I am your chief launch officer, Jamila Souffrant, the host of this show. And why am I saying that? Why am I introducing myself? Because a lot of you guys have been true listeners from the very beginning, but I may have a few new listeners right now. So if you're new to the show, you're now a journeyer. Since you're listening to this podcast, you are on the journey with me to financial freedom and independence. And by the way, it's not just me. There are thousands of other journeyers around the world with you on this journey, traveling to reach your best life and using money as a tool to get there. And so it is my duty to bring you the inspiration and content and actionable tips that you can use to help you on your journey, to help that rocket that you are getting ready to basically like launch, launch off, right? And so I'm just happy that you're here with me. Now, I can't wait for you to hear this episode. I'm gonna be talking more about who Kathy Heller is if you didn't know already. But before we get into who Kathy is and why you need to listen to this episode, I wanna just do some housekeeping So this is episode 129. So if you hear anything that Kathy and I mentioned in this, you're like, oh, that went too fast. I need to know more. Go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 129. And then also don't forget to follow me on social media. I am at Journey to Launch on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And then let me know that you're listening. So you can do that by screenshotting how you're listening on your phone and sharing it on your social media sharing it on your Instagram stories or your Facebook page or just with your family and friends and tag me if you can. But my biggest thing is as long as you are helping to get this word out there because there are more people who need to hear this. So don't be greedy, give to the needy who also need to hear how they can reach financial freedom and independence. So a little bit more about Kathy. I'm really excited to talk to Kathy because you'll hear as we have the conversation why she is so amazing and inspirational. So Kathy is the host of a popular podcast called Don't Keep Your Day Job. It actually has over 8 million downloads. Can you believe that? And she has an amazing backstory. She has been featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, HuffPost, New York Times, among many other distinguished publications. She interviews people who are creative entrepreneurs like she is on just basically how they got to where they got to and how you can, as a listener, reach your full potential. And so she has a book out also along that, talking about those topics. And I'm just so excited because I did read the book and it was really helpful in terms of, I just know that this kind of content is what you need to hear. So you're going to hear more about how Kathy went from basically not having much, really went to LA with nothing, but get signed to a record label as a writer and then got dropped from the record label and then found creative ways to still live her passion. At one point, she even thought like she lost it, like she she wasn't even writing anymore, but then she found a way to basically pick back up where she left off and actually do more than she thought she ever could with her writing and then transitioned that into being a full-blown entrepreneur with multiple, multiple uh, business streams and income streams. So I'm just excited to have Kathy on the show to talk to us about how we can continue to find and live out our true lives and passions and how we can really take what we're doing in a day-to-day basis, what we're good at, what we think we may be good at, and how do we turn that into something that can be sustainable that we can live off of. So you're going to love this conversation. Once again, this is episode 129. You can go to episode 129 to the show notes by going to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 129 for any more information. Now let's get into this amazing conversation with Kathy. Hey, 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 journeyers. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with Kathy Heller. Hi, Kathy. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. Now, I feel like what you do, your story, your background, and how you help people is exactly what my audience, what journeyers, as we call people who listen to my podcast, would love. So if they don't know you already, I'm sure they're going to 
get to know you and want to like follow up on what you're doing because you talk about exactly what we're doing, what we're trying to do. And that's essentially living your best life and living your passion and doing work that you love. So I'm excited to have you on the show to talk more about your work, how you came to do this. And then of course your new book. Cool. So you have a podcast and you have a book titled the same thing. Don't keep your day job, how to turn your passion into your career. Yeah. like, (laughs) <laughs> speaks to all of us. And so I'd love, love, love. One of the things that I try to do is that I, when I'm interviewing someone for, if they have a book out, I really try to go through the book so that I can make sure I'm speaking to yeah. points that matter. And I read and went through some of your book. And what I loved about it was your like backstory on finding your passion. Oh, really? So Thanks. yeah, because it reminded me so much of myself. So I want you to kind of take us back to why this was such an important thing for you to do to bring to the world because at some point like you struggled with finding what your passion was and now I mean you're doing so amazing in your career and how you help people so we'll get to all that but I want to go back to how you first started okay you're so sweet it's interesting that you said that you related to that part the most because my editor had to tell me don't forget to put your story in the book like go back make that chapter one and I was like oh I just want to talk to people about what they need and their pain points and give them tools And she said, no, you have to start with your story. And I think it is so true because if you've been down in a well, that's the only way you could help someone else out of a well. Like if you don't know someone's pain, it's hard for someone to listen or to feel like you get them. And so I think you're right. I think people need to hear the brokenness and they need to hear the mess and sort of where you came from. And so I think we all have been through just so much. Like if anyone is listening, I get it. Like your 11 year old self is probably amazed that you survived everything you did. And for me, it was, it was hard. I mean, I think a lot of people have similar stories. I don't think my story is like the worst story you've ever heard, but it was not easy growing up. My dad was an angry, scary person. My mom was a depressed person. My parents then broke up. My dad left. He never came back. I remember standing on the driveway, begging him to turn around and he never did. And he was gone. And then my mom fell apart and she actually had really like a breakdown and she started to try to commit suicide over and over and over again as I was growing up and I'd have to like call an ambulance and I was a little girl. So just a lot. And what got me through all of that was this dream that one day I would go so far from there and people would see me because I felt so invisible. And I thought maybe one day if I got, you know, my dream fulfilled, I'd become like a songwriter because what what I loved most of all was music. Music helped me deal with things that felt too big and music made me feel like I could celebrate when I was feeling so sad. So anyway, I wound up leaving home and I came out to LA and they don't just give you a record deal. You have to kind of figure that out. And I worked so hard. You know, I just got a day job and worked super hard to write songs. And at first they were not such good songs and then they got better. And then I finally met the right people. And I actually got a record deal and I was signed to Interscope and my producer, Ron Fair, he wanted to impress me. It was like my first week being signed. And I went to see Lady Gaga record paparazzi. And I sat there in the studio watching her behind the glass and it was amazing. And I was like, oh, I'm here. And anyone in my life, my mom, my dad, the people who didn't see me, like now they'll see me and they'll hear and they'll know. And you know what happened is a few months later, I actually got dropped from the label. And I didn't have a clue of what I would do. And I remember being on the side of the freeway. I had just gotten the call and I just couldn't move in the car. I was crying like, where do I go from here? What do I do? Like, how do I go get a normal job when I had this moment of like almost? In any case, everybody said to me, you have to do it. You have to be practical. You have to be real. You have to go get a job job. And so I got a job job. I worked at a nonprofit. I was like, oh, if I'm going to have a job, I'll do something nice for the world. But it was dysfunctional and hard and I hated it. And then a friend said to me, if you're going to work, you should just make a lot of money because as long as you're not doing the thing you love, like just make money. And I'm like, well, what do you do to make money? And she's like, you either go into finance or you sell real estate. I was like, yeah, okay. So she introduced me to a friend of hers who worked in commercial real estate where he bought like $300 million shopping centers And she's like, you should go work for him because he's a billionaire. I'm like, great, I'll work for him. So I worked for him and he paid me really well. He paid me like 150 grand. I was like 25. He paid me all this money to basically call these like really wealthy investors and set up lunch meetings for him. And I was driving a fancy car and eating good sushi and I was so unhappy. 
I was like, this is so not me. I do not recognize myself in the Were mirror. you writing still at that point? Or you had no, given that up? Yeah. Completely given it up. I actually walked into his office in Brentwood and his beautiful office one day. And I was like, Rob, I'm going to leave. I can't do this anymore. And he was like, you know, I knew eventually you'd, you'd go do something else. He's like, but you're crazy. You're making so much money for a 25 year old. I was like, I can't. And I left my job and my parents and friends and people who knew me were like, are you insane? What are you doing? Dreams don't happen to people like us. You have to be lucky. You have to know somebody. You're da, da, da. And I thought there must be another way to do the thing I love. And I think for most of us, we either think it's, it is Beyonce or bust. Like it's their sense of like, either I'm going to be the biggest and I'm going to have the biggest following or forget it. I'll just have to go sit at this job that I hate. Like th that's not the question. That's the wrong question. The question is, is there any other way to be in the world doing the things I love? And I started to ask that question. Is there any other way? Is there any other way to do music? Is there any other way to feel like myself every day and not wear a pantsuit? And I wound up doing research and I figured out that there was a whole other path where artists were licensing songs to film and TV. They were writing songs for ads and TV shows and trailers and singing the songs. KT Tunstall's song, Where's in Devil, Where's Prada? And all these cool indie artists were on Grey's Anatomy. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think of that. I was like, cool, let me put all my eggs in that basket and see what happens. And so I started to pick up the phone and use that real estate background to be scared and call people anyway and ask them questions like, what do you need? And that's what sales is. It's like service. How do you help? How? Do, what, what kind of music could I create that would actually help you tell the story of the movie you're writing or the show you're creating? And it worked. And after a while, within like a year and a half, I got my first license. It was for a Hasbro ad. They gave me $55,000 to use the song, just to use it, not to own it. Right. And then from there, it was like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Walmart, and then TV shows like One Tree Hill, Grey's Anatomy, like Switched at Birth. It was amazing. And I turned around and I was making 300 grand a year. And I did that full time for 10 years. For a decade, that's what I did. I went to the studio, wrote a song, and the next day I would get on the phone and pitch the song. Write a song, pitch the song, write a song, pitch the song. And after a decade, other artists started coming out of the woodwork saying like, how are you doing this? I don't understand. I want not you teach me? And somebody heard me on a music podcast. I didn't know what podcasts were, but I was a guest on somebody's music podcast. And this woman wrote to me and she said, is there any way that you could teach this online? Because I don't live in LA. I can't come buy you lunch. I can't meet you. But could you teach me how to license music to film and TV? And I was like, online course? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wound up, her name is Tiana Gustafson. I, I wound up taking her advice, this girl, this sweet, generous girl, and uh, I started an online course and it made a million dollars. Okay. So I feel like... Isn't that crazy? <laughs> it's crazy. Like your whole story to me is so fascinating. The thing about you, what I really connect to, and I think a lot of journeyers and listeners will connect to too, is that this feeling that we're not harnessing the magic. And you say this in your book yeah. about not harnessing the magic inside of us. And, you know, we are taught to follow the rules. And so when we go through traumatic experiences, like, so for you growing up and what that felt like and seeing, so one of the things you say is that you saw your mom, you felt like the reason for the way she was is because she yeah. was not living like her full yeah, life. Her sense. dreams were dying inside of her. And I feel like we all are born with so much promise and like, it's not the world tells us what we can't do, especially like I'm a mom, you're a mom. So it's like, you get it. Cause sometimes you have to tell your kids, you have to follow these rules. And then yeah. you, then you kind of see like the, the brightness and creativity kind of flow from them because they're told like what to do yeah. all the time. Yes. But it's, it's that same magic that we lose as we grow up yeah. and then we feel so lost in the world. So I just think um, that's such a, I think most people can relate to that feeling. You kind of skipped over this, but I really like this part of your story is that you said you were thinking about like the only way that you can be in the music industry was to actually like write the songs like and be signed to a label. And you picked up a magazine and you happened to like find this section about yeah. licensing music. Yeah. And I think that is interesting because so many people look at their dream in one way and one yeah. approach. And there are so many other ways in which you can approach it because look, you said, wait, maybe it's not that it could be something totally different. And look at totally. look how much look how well it did. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true what you're saying. I think that we reach for the highest branch we see possible. And I think often it just wasn't modeled for us. Think about kids whose one one parent is a truck driver and the other parent's a school teacher. You think, oh, I could be a truck driver or a school teacher. And then maybe there's a guy down the road who does something creative. He works in marketing and you're like, oh, but I want to be creative. So I'll do marketing. It's like, it's just based on what, what path you see is possible. Then you can chart a course, right? 
So I think that what you're saying is true. I think that if we don't have a sense of what's possible, if we don't see it modeled for us, it's hard to even know how to reach for it. And so I only saw it as all or nothing. And what I've done now, actually, my team and I, we actually created a quiz on kathyheller.com, which helps you figure out which one of the four archetypes might actually be best suited to help you. Because I've interviewed now over 200 successful creative entrepreneurs from Bobby Brown, the makeup artist, and Howard Schultz, who started Starbucks, and Mandy Moore, and Jenna Fisher, and Brian Grazer, and Colby Calais, who's also a songwriter, all these people. And I was able to step back and see that all these people fit into one of four archetypes. The one person is, is the maker, right? Like you write the song, you make the pottery, you, you bake the bread. The second version would be like a teacher. Like some people really are lit up when they're teaching bread baking or they're teaching someone how to write a song or they're teaching someone how to be productive and they start an online course about productivity. So maker, teacher, then the next one is like curator. There are people who they they love music so much, but they don't want to be the performer. They want to be around music all day long. So maybe yeah. you become an agent for other people's music or you start to curate festivals and shows. And then the last one is an investigator. Like Maybe you don't want to make the thing or teach the thing or curate the thing, but maybe you just love this conversation around feminism or happiness or work-life balance or music or any topic. And you decide, I'm going to just talk about it and investigate it. I'm going to write books about that topic. I'm going to interview people on a blog. I'm going to start a vlog. I'm going to whatever podcast. And that can be a career. And I think that when people start to see those four archetypes, they're like, wait, Instead of me having to make jewelry or not, I could just have good taste in jewelry and I could be a curator. I could create a whole web store web store, or I could do a magazine where I like gather all these different jewelers together and interview them and I could get paid to shop. I could get, you know, that's the thing we don't necessarily know. And it's a hundred percent true that there is room for us. Like you said before, and I just want to like speak to it because it was so important what you said. I think that the number one thing that holds everybody back is that we have shut off this creativity. I used to think that people were either creative or they weren't. I used to think like, oh, like there's some people who like to perform or be outgoing and some people are, they don't want to do that. But I realize it's not true. Like I think about my daughter who's three and I think about her classroom filled with preschoolers. There's not one kid in that classroom who doesn't jump up at the chance to be creative. Yeah. And and it's because what they all have in common is that all of those little kids, they let themselves be messy. There's paint in their hair. There's chalk on their nose. And it's okay. Yeah. And I think what happens to us, like you said, is at some point when you're four, five, eight, 12, 14, there's this criticism, there's this judgment, there's this rejection, and it comes in and we like build an armor where we're like, oh, well, I don't want to get ridiculed. I don't want to be judged. So right. you want to fit in and it's funny because they say like if you give like a three-year-old or a little kid a paperclip, right? And you say, what's this? They don't really know what's a paperclip yet. They'll come up with a million things. That yeah, they can definitely. Do. It's an yeah. airplane. It's this. And as Whatever, the kids yeah. get older, eventually it it's starts becoming what it is. It's a paperclip, <laughs> right? And so it's curious. It's interesting because I have my kids are pretty young too. And the balance of knowing how they should fit into this world when it benefits yeah. them, but to then still keep that creativity is interesting as a parent. <laughs> it really is. And I think it goes back to giving ourselves a big old permission slip to be messy. And when I had Seth Godin on my show, he said it so well. He's like, Kathy, you know, in order to be successful, you have to have the courage to make mediocre things. Your first podcast won't be your best. Your first song won't be good. Your first blog post won't be the one that you love more than any other. But in order to get to the brilliant ones, you have to give yourself the grace to let yourself start to learn to ride the bike and fall off and get back on. And I think that everyone who's listening has something beautiful, something necessary to share with the world. The only thing that they're missing is momentum. And if you look at successful people, they go ahead and start. They have an action taking bias. It's yeah. like, even when they feel like vomiting, they're going to press publish on the podcast. Even when right. they're terrified and they don't know, if, that's all it comes down to is the courage and the willingness to face our own inadequacy and give ourselves the grace to not have it perfect and just begin. And what I've learned is that the world doesn't need it perfect. In fact, what makes it more beautiful, truly, truly, 
is when you lean into the vulnerability and the messiness because all day long when people are on their phone, and let's face it, that's where everyone is all day long, (laughs) what they're scrolling for is to feel less alone. So when you're only this perfect version of yourself, it actually doesn't really connect. But when you can say, this is the thing that I made, this is the thing that I wrote and I'm figuring it out just like you and I feel anxious and I don't have it all together and my marriage isn't perfect and whatever it is that you feel comfortable to share, it's like oxygen for the soul and people will be magnetized to you. Yeah, people relate to that. And one of the things, so I love actually, so these four types of um, roles that you can have, I also think it can evolve too. And I also think people get stuck with where they can start just because you pick or you're in one way, right? So I have yeah. to think of myself, like I think, okay, ultimately I would love just to create. Let me just create the, you know, the platform and then not have to necessarily do all the other things, right? But in some regards to get to that point, I might have to go through some other stages first and it's okay for me to find which one works. And maybe I'll get to that stage and say, oh, I actually don't like the creator stage. I actually prefer this other one, right? So I think that also stops people because they think they have to pick one and stick with it forever. So how do you feel about that? I mean, I just feel like what you're saying is speaking to the greatest human need, which is what I've realized in the last several years is that the number one thing that people want so badly is to feel seen. And so this idea of choosing, it brings up like, well, wait a minute, if I choose this one thing, then what about the other parts of me? Will I be, will I be fully expressed? Will people actually get it? And it's like, honey, everything you do comes along, right? So when you start down one path and you make a choice and you go all in, the reason why people wind up going to your Etsy shop isn't just because you're a maker, it's because of your personality. It's because of everything that you are, that all comes to the table And what I found is that most people who are really successful wind up using like a hyphen and they're not just the maker. They're also a teacher. They're also an investigator. And you just have to start through one door and then you walk through the one door and you start to get footing and then you can keep adding. And eventually you don't have to make it an either or you can do all of the, I do all of those things, right? I write music. I have a podcast, which is my investigator side. Music is obviously the maker side. And I just wrote a book and I'm still teaching online courses. So I get to teach, I get to create. And then I'm also a curator because there's a lot of times where I will put an event together of other speakers, or I will do something in the music world where I will help other artists put together a showcase. Like I like wearing all of those hats. And I think that you don't have to choose and you don't have to be worried that you're going to get left behind. One thing that I want to say on this topic, it's just dawning on me to share is that the heart of it is we are built to serve. And I think that we forget that if we want to be successful in anything, in our relationship with our kids, in our business, in our marriage, it's called radical, 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 radical empathy. This whole idea of like, well, what if I have to choose and what we're, we're missing the boat. Our job every day is to serve another person. And the reason I know that is because they've done as many studies as they could do to figure out what makes us happy and what makes people happy. It's not checking off the boxes of like income or car or travel. It's contribution. It's meaning. That's what makes us happy. It's actually serving other people. That's what makes us feel most lit up. So if you really know that that's ultimately what you're seeking and that is how you get to feel seen, then we have to realize, start by thinking what are the things that I do that really serve? And what are the things that I like to do that I know how to do that could actually offer something to someone else? And then if I can start there, I can be open to where the world will give me more feedback. And then I can keep pivoting. Like for me, I had this idea that I wanted to be a superstar. And that was the the way that I was trying to control my destiny. I'm going to be, you know, Sheryl Crow. I'm going to be this person. And the world said, no. And instead of holding on, I kept opening another door. And then as I grew more than my, even though my music started to be successful on film and TV, it's nowhere near how successful my podcast is with almost 10 million downloads in two years. It's nowhere near as successful as all these other things I've done, the courses I've made that have made $2 million a year coaching and teaching. But that took the willingness to be like, where does the world say yes. It's like that game of like colder, hotter, you know, and you keep listening. So that, that sort of empathy, it will lead you to a greater mission than you may have planned. 
and greater purpose. Does yeah, that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I forgot who I think it was Ira Glass, and he has this beautiful video about the um gap that a lot of oh, us as creators Yes, oh, face. This is for a lot of people, like they see the ultimate of what they'd like to become. They see where they are and how far they are away from it. And like that gap is frustrating for a lot of people. And so that happens a lot. Like, I mean, this is life. This is a life journey. And so that's oh, where, yeah. like thinking of all the things they want to do and as it relates to money and not in the lack of it or lack of resources to create the biggest thing that you know you can create. But sure. it literally starts step by step, right? It's like, what's the next best step? What is allowing myself to bring myself fully into this world to serve best? And so I yep. just, I love that. And what I do really love about the book is that you actually get practical tips on building. So yes, there's a lot of um, in, inner work, which is super important to get to the actual, what yeah, is it that the you root can do? Of it, yes. You can be in alignment. Yeah. And actually and, feel confident and go out there and be ready to be unleashed. But right. then- you need some tools. Yeah. Like what happens next? And here's what I love because so my overall platform, we talk about money and a lot of listeners, like they want to become financially independent and free. And doesn't mean they want to work. They just want to work do, to do the things they love. Good. And I love this idea of runway, like creating a runway, like while, oh, so yeah. while you're in your job, your whole premise is also like, while you're working to quit this job that you hate. You can use this to build your runway and to test out ideas and to do all these amazing things where you can still enjoy the process. A hundred percent. And I think that's so important because I've seen people set themselves up to fail by just like quitting their job. Like, that's it. You know, like Jerry Maguire, he's like, I'm out, you know, and then he's like, oh, no, I need a client. I'm dying. Right. You're like panicked. I think it's much wiser and I think it actually can nourish the dream job so much more if you stayed at your job, let your job act as the investor toward this thing, right? All of a sudden you'll look at your job differently. If you know that this job is providing the money for you to pay your bills so that you can use the next six months to build the runway and then do those important steps now before you leave. And the biggest step, and we can break it down into a few steps, but the biggest idea here is validate the idea, proof of concept, so what does that mean? There's a few benchmarks you'd want to hit before you left your job, meaning you'd want to know that you figured out, A, what you're offering. Like, what are you doing? Are you teaching a class? Are you making cake pops? Are you writing these, you know, hand-lettered stationary uh, thank you notes? Like, what are you doing, right? What's the offer? Who's it for? Really, as specific as you can be, who's buying the stationery? Is it brides? Is it new moms? Is it baby stationery? Like, what is it? Who's buying these cake pops? Are they gluten-free? Are they vegan? Where do these people hang out? And then you want to get in front of these people and test the idea. You want to let them see the invitations. You want to let them taste the cake pops. You want to let them give a trial of the yoga class. And before you leave that job, you want to make sure that you've made something that they like, that they're going to keep coming back to. And then you can scale that, price that, and scale it a little bit before you leave, meaning... Let's say the people who are going to buy the stationery from you, they are brides, okay? So you're making stuff for weddings and all that stuff. So you could go door to door and try to find a bride every single day, or you could figure out where do those brides already go? Are they already reading a certain blog? Are they already going to a certain banquet hall? Are they already going to an event planner? Because then that person or that blog or that thing becomes sort of a, a way of for you to find many, 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 many more of the people that you serve so once you have that laid out, that's something you can then rinse and repeat, right? That's, that's something you could now take to the bank. So before you leave the job, you want to know what you want to do, who it's for. You want to make sure that it's validated, that people like it, right? You want to serve them. You want to price an offer. And if you price it too high, you'll know. It's okay. Don't be scared. If you price it too low, you'll know. Because if they say yes right away, maybe you could have priced it higher. Once you do that a few times you could leave your job because you now know who you're serving, what you're making, and you know that they like it. So now if you had more time, you would just be working on doing everything that you could to build the brand, build the audience, right? Because you know you have something that's validated. That takes time anyway. You can do that right now while you have your job. You can do it as a side hustle if you don't have a job. Right. And I think it's important to realize that while it might be frustrating if you're currently working and not enjoying it, or it's just like mentally like toiling, to also like be full time entrepreneur and then be struggling mon like with money is even more stressful. So I think it's an important thing to note. And then the other thing that you talk about 
is building a network. Like that's so important (laughs) and how to tactfully and creatively do that, where it's really this way in which that's the only way you're going to like get your message and product or whatever it is that you want out into the world to flourish is to build a network and have it to be something that's really authentic and in the way totally. you create relationships. And I thought it was pretty cool the way you started creating the networks, right? Because the biggest thing that I saw in your story was it seems like you have a knack at creating networks. And so in order to do that for a lot of people, actually, it's not that easy for them. You know, I get tons of now like emails or just people reaching out. And I'm just like, oh, they could benefit from some advice on like how to do that better. And then there are some people who do it the right way. And I'm just like, perfect. You know, so exactly. Exactly. I think that that's a really important point because I've often told friends of mine, like you will get disproportionately rewarded when you know how to connect with other people, that part of the business. Like, let's say there's somebody else. She actually has better taste in cake pops. They look better, but she's not good at outreach. And if you are you will crush her every day of the week because it's a people business. Everything is people. It's not numbers. It's humans. So what happens is when people do outreach, they get scared. All of a sudden they get into this like very businessy voice and they're like giving you like their biggest, most impressive, long winded email. Right. And it's like, hi, Kathy, my name is so-and-so. And and I did this, this, this. And since seventh grade, I've been doing this. And it's like on and on and on and on. And then it's like, can you help me? So it just doesn't work. I mean, think about if you were meeting somebody at camp or on an airplane or at a dinner party and you walked over and you were like, hey, let me tell you everything about myself and let me ask you to do something for me. You'd be like, this person is weird. Like, that's just not the rhythm. What's better is when you realize there's another human on the other end of this email who's going to read this and they have feelings just like you. They have a dog to take to the vet after work, just like you. Their job isn't to wait for strangers to write to them and then figure out a way to help a stranger. But it's actually so easy to connect if you're not asking, if you're not putting your hands in their pockets right away, but you're actually offering, right? And you're making a human connection. So my friend, Laura Belgray says, it's like writing a letter to a bestie. That should be your email. So I started to get the hang of that in my music business. I started realizing nobody cared about me being impressive and sending links to every single song of mine. It was much more impressive to people when I would say, hey, my name is Kathy. I'm a mom. When I'm not listening to the Frozen soundtrack for the 15,000th time, I'm writing music. I'm just so curious. Then ask a specific question. Like I saw you written about in this article and I love what you said about this. And then ask them something fun. You know, I've never been to Minnesota and I know you live there what should I do if I ever come and visit? It gives people a chance to answer a really simple, fun, easy to answer question. And then you can say, you are probably so busy, no rush on reply and thanks. And it's like, oh, what a lovely, refreshing email from someone who didn't try to sell me on something. She didn't ask me for help. She just wanted to let me know she appreciated something I I said in in an article, or she just wanted to reach out and tell me she likes my work or whatever. And she asked me an easy to answer question. So I can start like a volleyball going back and forth. You just want to get the ball back over the net. And then like for every few deposits you make emotionally, you could then ask for something, but I would do it in the sense of like, how can I support you? Right? Like where's the value add? Like, let's say you make the cake pops and you're reaching out to a guy who owns a coffee shop and you would like him to sell them wholesale. Right? So it's like, would this offer value to your audience, to the people who come into your shop what could I make to help support you? Oh, well, you know, I don't need cake pops, but I do need blondie brownies. Could you make those? Let me think about that. Maybe I could whip something up like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like value add, make the relationship. And people, sometimes they walk into rooms with their agenda of like what they need from the person and what they want them to say. And actually maybe that person wasn't going to connect with you or want that thing, but maybe there were so many other ways you could have collaborated that were left on the table because there wasn't just this, like, I'm here in this room to meet you in this moment. And then whatever is supposed to be will be, and I could be open to like how I can help you or your idea. And you could then find so much momentum connecting to like three people a month. Your business would skyrocket. Yeah. Just from that. Yeah. And I would say really my success has, you know, obviously putting the work in, but it's really been my relationships and connecting with people. And the best thing I like about emails like that is I totally understand if you can't respond. Mm -hmm. I totally appreciate that you're busy because (laughs) like there's some empathy there. Right. Because, you know, when I get emails from people and it's just like demanding like response or time or there's no mention that you have ever listened to like anything I've done 
or you appreciate something. It's more just like, can I do this? Can I have this? And right. it's and just like, And then people no. will be like, you know, the world is so mean. The industry is so cruel. And I'm like, people are humans. It's not like, personal most not times. Cool. Yeah. No, but yeah. it's like, it's no one's job to hand us opportunities. It's our job to show up for other people. And when you lead with that, my friend Jordan Harbinger, he's like, always be generous. ABG, always be giving. Just do that all the time. It's fun. It feels good. And you'll never have to worry about your business because you'll be thinking constantly. Every time I'm doing anything, I realize that even the person in my business world, forget just my audience, the person in business who I'm talking to is still a person who wants to feel seen. Don't forget that when you're reaching out to people and then it makes it so easy. People are like, well, how, how did you get all those celebrity guests on your podcast? And I'm like, I just sent those personable kinds of emails. There was a lot of enthusiasm. It wasn't long winded. It wasn't like, here's everything I've ever done. I wasn't trying to be impressive. I was trying to be human. And so here's the thing too, this is for anything, not just like, maybe there's some people listening and it's like their goal is not to start a business or have a, be an entrepreneur. Totally fine too. But this is just life. Like this idea of rejection, it's necessary. It's like the failure, quote unquote, or the rejection or someone telling you no. One is not taking it personally. So there are times where I've sent an email and not gotten a response, but I didn't take it personally sure. or got Fine. rejected. I'm still responding with, but thank you for your time. And then there's opportunities where I work with the person again and it comes around versus if I were to take it personally and say, well, now I'm not going to like email them or talk to them again because I feel so slighted. And I feel like some people do that. And this is just life in general, whether it comes to a job or connecting with friends and family is that most people are not thinking about you. They're thinking about like what's going on in their own <laughs> world. Totally. And so the response at that moment may have nothing to do with you. No, I think it's, it's totally true. It's totally true. And I feel like everybody who's listening, we're all the same. We all have imposter syndrome. We're all afraid of being rejected. We've all had trauma. Like everyone who's listening has been through a lot. And there've been times where as a little kid, that was so intense, like the rejection, either somebody passed away and left or somebody didn't love you back or somebody was a mean, cruel person. And so you're like hardwired to protect yourself and do anything you can to not get rejected. But the thing is, what I like to think about is, okay, so people already don't like me. There are people right now who think I'm an idiot. There are people who don't like Seinfeld. There are people who don't like Beyonce. You could be the most delicious person piece of watermelon ever. People, some, I don't like watermelon. I only like peaches. It's like, it's already done. There's already people who don't like you. So the bottom line I think of all the time is like, am I going to let these people, this group over here that thinks I'm annoying or whatever, stand in the way of all the people that I know I could serve and I could help if I push through feeling uncomfortable from these people? There's 7 billion other people in the world. It's like, okay, some of you yeah. don't like me. Well, that's happened since middle school. You know what I mean? And it's like, so what? And you'll find the people who do connect with you. And thank God not everybody likes you because that's why there will be people who do because there's a democracy. And some people only like this podcast. Some people can't stand this other one. Good. It leaves room for you to find your tribe and to find the people who get you. Yeah. And that's where that only happens when you bring your, yourself to the table, when you can be vulnerable and let that like shine through because people really want to see and connect with that. They totally do. But I just want to be compassionate to all of us because it's not easy. And that's why I said before, everyone who's listening has been through a lot. And we we forget how much those things in our history have hardwired us because you're smart. At one point you were a little girl who was like, I need to survive. So a survival skill is going to be don't put yourself out there because you won't survive if you do. Right. So just stay in this box and, and you learn how to overcompensate and only be a certain way. But what I find that people do is they get to a certain age and they realize I'm not living my own life. I'm living the life. I'm becoming a character that someone else made me be. And I think becoming who we are is unbecoming the things that we're not. And sometimes these old survival skills that protected us, they don't protect us anymore. Now they're actually yeah. keeping us down. And I was thinking the other day about water and I was thinking like, my family and I, we went on a hike and we were passing by this pond and the water is stagnant. It's sitting there and you look at it. And I was like, oh my God, this, because my daughter was like playing. I go, don't touch it. It was gross. It's green. It's poison. It's algae. Everything's dead inside of it. It's just sitting stuck. And then we were walking later on and there's like this Creek where the water is moving. 
And she said, can I touch this? I said, yeah, that, that water's clean. And why is that? Because water that's moving, you can drink it, you can bathe in it, you can, it's life-giving and the water that's stagnant, it literally, it's deadly. What's that about? It's a metaphor I felt like for us, like we want to grow. And if we're not growing out of our comfort zone, if we stay stagnant, there's a part of us that's like dying and it feels like poison. And as hard as it is and as scary as it is, I think the reason that we love movies is because we love watching that person overcome that thing they're really scared yeah. of, whether it's speaking their truth or applying for that job or getting back up because they've been hit in the jaw and they get back up again. I think it's a quality inside of us that we want to hone that. We want to, we want to get out of our comfort zone. We don't really want to sit and watch Netflix all day. Yeah. And that often happens with now with all the forms of media that we have. So podcasts and television and Instagram and social media. So we can now see so many different types of lives that we may want to also kind of live in our own heads like out. And like you said, like the movie where most people, when they look at someone who is a, who's inspirational or impressive to them, they see them, that other person as the hero unknowing yet that they also can be the same hero, like not the same type, but in their own life, you can do that thing too. Yeah. And so I, I just love that. Yeah. I learned something this year. I never heard this term before, but it's called pluralistic ignorance. Basically what that is, is when you look at other people and you assume that the reason they're successful is because they don't have the flaws that you have. It's this sense of like, oh my God, I'm such an imposter. I'm such a fraud. The reason that all these other people can be successful is because they don't have those insecurities. They don't have those quirks that I have. And that is pluralistic ignorance because that is completely not true. Like, you know yourself really well, which is why like, you know, your own ways of sabotaging and you know how you show up and get in your own way. So you don't see the other person, but every single person, every one of us has our ways which actually means we should give them more credit. Meaning like if you see Justin Timberlake at the Hollywood Bowl or you're looking at a painting by Michelangelo or you're, you're sitting at Apple and you're marveling at how well they do what they do. No, they didn't have this perfect genetics. It's not like they were given this card that was like, you come from the best family. You look the best. You have the best IQ. No, they were just as quirky, just as insecure. And they had tremendous courage to do it anyway and feel broken. It's fascinating to me how we look at other people and we're like, oh, I could never do that. And we measure our behind the scenes, messy lives to people's highlight reels. People are not posting their failures online. Okay. It doesn't mean they don't have them every second. In my own world of social media, I try to post my own insecurities and stuff to, to be like a, a lighthouse in the storm, but no, no, no. Like you are not a unicorn because you are, are, are crazy in certain ways. We all are. We're all just doing the best we can. Everyone is a hot mess. It <laughs> is everything being a human being. Just the other day, I posted on my Instagram and I was saying, just trying to heal my emotional trauma, grow a business that's changing the world, be the best person I can be for the people I love, forgive the people who hurt me, eat right, exercise, meditate, keep growing, working hard to be the first in my family to break generational trauma patterns, right? And it's like, Oh my God, that yes. was from Girls Building Empires. I reposted their post. It's just like so true. How could we not have our own stuff? How could you think that Beyonce doesn't cry and feel sad and how she's going through so much just like you? She's a person. Yeah, Everybody. yeah. And I think it's interesting how that works where the magnitude, like sometimes from the outside looking in, and this especially happens with money, you assume. And yes, okay, there are different levels of privilege, privileges that people have. But taking that aside, right? When you do look at someone and what they've gone through to get to the level that they've gotten to, then you can be assured, even with money, if someone's making a lot of money, someone will say, well, you know, when I make a lot of money, then my problems will be solved or, oh, that person's making a lot of money, easy for them to do these things. And so, yes, there is a level of, you know, we're not talking about poverty here and people who like can't pay like their bills, but for most people having more money actually won't solve the problem. You've come a long way, um, it seems, too, like from creating such successful businesses that are in different types of parts of your business that earn so much money and generate income, where you could probably see like the more that you do make, the more responsibility, the more things that you oh are God. in charge of. Totally. Um, 
So it's not like, you know, some people can roll their eyes and be like, whatever, like, I'd rather have that problem. <laughs> but it's interesting because new level, new devil. Like, it's, and I'm experiencing that now myself, where, like, as I grow, that I'm just like, oh, here's a new thing <laughs> that I was not worried about before because I, I wasn't faced with this. And now it's even like more pressure or at least yep. more things I have to be concerned about. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. There's a lot of stuff to unpack in that, but I just wanted to respond a couple to a couple of things. Number one, I mean, my husband and I both, like I met him when I moved out to LA 13, 14 years ago and his dad passed away when he was a kid and they lived in a little apartment and he didn't even have a bedroom. He slept on the floor and he put himself through school and they ate off of food stamps. And then he took the bus until he was like 25 and put himself through law school. And I came out here with nothing. And it's so easy to look at people and they're like, they can judge you and assume that you had money, you had support. I didn't even have emotional support. My parents, one left and one was in a psychiatric hospital. So I really challenge people with that. Like, I wonder if we're really underestimating our own resourcefulness because I know what it's like not to have anything. And I think our greatest resource are the resources inside of us, passion, compassion, enthusiasm. When you want something, if you really, really want it, you can muster the resources to figure it out as opposed to saying like, oh, I can't because of this. Well, then you can't, yeah, right? I had, a friend, yeah. I had a friend last year who needed a bone marrow transplant. And that's a resource that's very hard to find. You can't just go to Walgreens and buy one, right? Like he couldn't find a match. And so they got super resourceful to save his life. And they wound up doing every single thing they could. And they thought, oh my God, maybe we could get like Kylie Jenner to tweet about it. Like they did everything they could to save this kid's life. And they wound up getting thousands and thousands of people to donate bone marrow, however they do the donation. I think it's like a swab or whatever. Not only did they find a match, they found eight other matches for eight other people. And it's like, don't tell me that you don't have what it, what, what you need. Like inside of every human being, when you turn on that light switch and you show up and you have the vulnerability to put it out there and say, this is what I want and this is what I'm able to give and I'm going to be generous. I'm like, no, no, no. Like every person underestimates how incredible one human being can be when we show up and we get out of our own way. So that's number one. But number two, money is a tool. I look at money like a hammer. Like you could pick up a hammer and smash something to pieces, or you could pick up a hammer and build something. Mm, yeah. And that's money. It's a tool. Like the more money you have, you could be destructive or the more money you have, you could be so good and so kind. And you could put your name on museums and hospitals and build these things and help people or even just take your friend to lunch. Like you can do so much. I look at it like a resource. Like why would I want just enough energy? Why would I want just enough oxygen? Why would I want just enough water? It's like, no, you want plenty so that you can do more with it. I heard Oprah, I went to see her live last year and she was talking about how she used to ask God every single day for the clarity of how to be a good custodian for the money that he was giving to her because she became responsible to do good things with this money. And I think that is such a beautiful way to look at it. Like you get to be the custodian of these resources that you can allocate, but you're right in the sense that like, it's not a just check this box and have more money. Actually, the research shows that there's more depression and drug addiction in places where people have the most money because it's very easy to then not have a reason, a purpose, a mission, right? The more you could just sit there, order yourself some food on Postmates, watch Netflix all day, how are you needed? How are you contributing? Again, happiness doesn't come from money. It comes from fulfillment and purpose. So it's often that people who feel the need to do something, right, they're going to be happier. So I think the challenge is the more money you have, it can actually be a spiritual challenge because you have to keep finding a new frontier. You have to keep asking yourself, how else can you serve and what else can you do or else you, you're going to be unhappy? Yeah. The contrast it's so important and people don't like hearing it in the moment because, you, you know, you don't like it. It's something uncomfortable or you, you know, you are without, you feel lack, but that lack allows you to realize what you want and what you want to strive towards. And I look at like my mom, her not having much of anything, but fighting and building a way. And she knew based on how she grew up, what she wanted to give to me. And I'm not saying like, if she had a better like childhood, she wouldn't have been such a good mom to me, but 
these are the kind of things, the building blocks. So, so many people like on this journey right now listening and they're sure there are things that you don't like and things that are not fair. But these are the same things that will push you forward. It's it's prompting you, hopefully, because you're listening to this podcast. So it's like a first step of, you know what, I do want better, is that you know now that you don't want that. Hopefully you're inspired to action, to really digging deep. And sometimes it's small stuff, right? It's not like, you know, tomorrow you're going to wake up and everything's going to be different. Sometimes it's these small little changes, but it starts with one small step. That's it. And then it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. Like the clarity comes through this action. So like you do the first thing and you'll show up. So you'll say, okay, I really should push myself. I should go to that networking event. And then you'll meet one person. You'll be like, oh, she was so cool. She and I are going to do a workshop together for these women in business. Oh, that was so cool. Then you get to that women in business thing that you put together and you go, oh, I know what I want to do. I'm going to start a podcast. Like the clues will be left for you as you take the next steps. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know what? I do want to ask you a question, another one, because I'm like so impressed how you were able to build your online platform and coaching. And you did mention that you um, took Amy Porterfield's course. I thought that was like so cool because I listened to a lot of podcasts, especially before I started my own. And I, I for sure know, all right, forgot which one I heard you on, but I heard your story when you were um, talking about like Amy Porterfield and like just like taking that course. You said that you made 450000 in your first year. Yeah, Isn't my that, first year. Isn't that crazy? Crazy. Yeah. And you still have that course, right? Yep. So you know a thing. And so this is the thing too about like teaching people how to sell like their talents online, which is so I think critical in this global economy and like yeah. online marketplace. So can you speak just a little bit to that? Because there are people right now, they have a skill. Maybe if they find now that they have this passion, they want to cultivate and do more of the best next steps to packaging it into something that they can sell or do. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole bunch of steps that go into creating an online course. We could spend hours talking about that. But on one foot, what I would say is for me, I was pregnant with my daughter. I was seven months pregnant. I knew she was going to be born in like just a few weeks. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to start an online course. I guess I should launch it before she's born. So like, think about how ridiculous that sounds. I had like eight weeks and I'm like, I'm going to do all of this. And so what I did is a a version of what I would teach, right? But I did it in a messy way because I was just doing the messy version. That's all I knew. But basically what you want to do is in order to sell a course, you don't just want to go right to the sale. Hi, people who've never heard of me. Here's a course like that doesn't work. So what you want to first do is build a little bit of an email list. So what I did is I created a cheat sheet on like, here are the seven or eight steps to license your music to film and TV. Because now currently I teach courses in entrepreneurship and how people can build their side hustle and I do coaching. But then the course was about what I knew then. I didn't have a podcast then. What I did then was teach people how to specifically do music for film and TV. So I started with a cheat sheet. What are the seven myths to building a career in in film and TV? And I I created an opt-in for that where people could give their email address in exchange for this cheat sheet. And I posted it on Facebook group and posted it in groups of songwriters and people online. Again, know your audience. Where are they? Where would they maybe be to download this information? I went on a couple music podcasts where there was an audience that might want this cheat sheet. And then there was about a thousand people that downloaded the cheat sheet in six weeks. And at the end of that, I told all of those people, I'm going to do a free class, which is a webinar. And I'm going to give you an hour of my time. And we're going to talk through all of these things. And so I got on, I was pregnant. I didn't have any slides. I didn't even know how to make slides. It was just me talking to a camera for an hour, being very genuine, very real with my pregnant belly. And at the end, I said, if you want to take my course, it's 997. And the very first enrollment, we did it twice in that year, but the very first enrollment, 147 people enrolled right then. And I was like, oh my God, I just made $147,000. I was like, whoa. Then we started the course. And three months later, I was like, I'm going to launch it again, but I'm going to do better this time. you know. And so I had a better cheat sheet. And then I, instead of just doing a webinar, I did a five-day challenge where every day for five days, I showed up for an hour. So five hours, every day for an hour for five days. And at the end of that, I said, if you want to join the course and 300 people joined wow. at the end of that. So I made over 450 grand. That's not that crazy. That's amazing. And I'm just impressed that you were able to like just break that down in like less than two minutes. So that was like a yeah. crash course. There's a on- lot we can talk about with courses, but I actually talk about building courses and building podcasts in one 
in Unbuilding Podcast in one chapter of the book. You do. You do. So that's why I'm encouraging everyone to go check out Kathy's book. Can you please let everyone know where they can pick it up and where they can find out more about you and all the amazing things you're doing? Yes, you're so sweet. So generous. Thank you. You can buy the book at Amazon. You can buy the book at Barnes & Noble. You can get the Audible version. You can get it wherever you want. You can come to kathyheller.com. Kathy's with a C. And you could take the quiz on my homepage on like what kind of career would be really best for you. And then I offer all kinds of things, retreats and coaching and all kinds of fun resources at the podcast. We have lots of cheat sheets you can download, lots of free resources and good stuff to help you come home to yourself, to help you feel more alive, to help you make a six-figure, seven-figure business doing stuff that really lights you up. Amazing. I love that. Now, and I'll link a lot of that in the episode show notes. Thanks so much again, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. I love it. I really hope you enjoyed that talk with Kathy. We covered a lot. And I think that this is one of those episodes where you should definitely listen to it again. And in terms of just like relating to the person inside of you, that childlike, creative, amazing little kid that you once were, that's still inside of you, like how to bring that out so that you can follow what really is going to make you happy. Some of it is like so simple that we have forgotten along the way of becoming an adult. And so I hope this conversation with Kathy awakens inside of you your passion or helps you to find your way. And then, of course, this is all leading back to the journey to financial freedom and independence, because ultimately we're on the journey to live our best lives. And one of the ways we do that is in the meantime. So while you do have your day job or you're building something to be excited about it, to lean into the journey, the ups and downs, the setbacks, which are always a setup for the comeback, right? So I hope you really enjoyed the conversation. Once again, episode 129. So you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash episode 129. You can also find how to reach Kathy there and listen to her amazing podcast and then order her book, which is out now. Don't keep your day job. Now, if you listen to this episode and you're like, wow, that struck a chord with me, that was amazing, let me know on social media. So tag me with like a takeaway or something that was amazing. Tag Kathy on Instagram, kathy.heller, and then tag me at Journey to Launch and let me know that you listened to the episode and that you loved it and let us know what you think. What was your biggest takeaway? Even if you just send this link or this podcast episode to your family and friends so that they can begin to get all the amazing information that's shared on this episode. Also, if you listen to this in Apple Podcasts, so that's that purple app on your iPhone, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Remember, you can subscribe and listen to this podcast anywhere. It's free, every week, great content. But if by chance you're listening to this on an iPhone, please review and rate and subscribe to the podcast in Apple Podcasts. That really helps me out. Um, I'm at about 800, it will probably be a little bit more than 800 when this episode comes out, 800 reviews and ratings, which is amazing. And my goal is to get well over a thousand at some point, hopefully as soon as possible. So if you are really enjoying the podcast, do me a favor and just leave a rating that really helps me because I read every single one and other people when they search this podcast and they're like, whoa, like people really care about this thing because look how many ratings and reviews that she has. All right. So until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. Journeyers.